that is uh it's almost time for golf shirt weather it's gonna be in the 40s today i'm ready to bring out my motorcycle except it's a little salty so i'm gonna wait i'm gonna wait for the salt to fade away i can't see if i'm running so if you're out there give me a thumbs up or something i got i got I worked on this last night, and I had too much leisure today, and, you know, it takes away some of the intense panic that I get uh, on, on many days. <laughs> no, no intense panic today. It's just a relaxed Monday morning, and uh, I'm trying to find out if anybody sees me streaming. Oh, yeah, LinkedIn does. Okay. So, link, looking good on Monday. There we go. Okay, we got somebody that's... You know, it's like Earth, Earth to Spaceship Beagle. <laughs> okay, enough goofing around. Five, four, three, two, one. I'm John Miglosh for the Wisconsin DMA and the International Society for Strategic Marketing. Okay, let's get over to the real news. Here we go. Okay, Tom Fishburne says, sustainability marketing. What's our plan for sustainability? Our brand's already sustainable. Our packaging is recyclable at least theoretically, in a lab test, right? <laughs> Problem with most of that recyclable <laughs> recyclable packaging is if you put it in a landfill and bury it with no oxygen, it, it'll last forever. <laughs> we donate to causes with green names. <laughs> Tom, I think you should have said with green in the name. <laughs> but it's about the same. Anyway, we even use claims like eco-happy, whatever that would mean. But isn't there more we can do? I underlined it in red. Of course, we haven't started advertising about it yet. Okay, so we're going to talk about sustainability today. I know something about sustainability. Most of my clients, uh, you know, were in business for 100 years or 50 years or a long time, unless they were startups. In which case, I helped them with that. But many of my clients were legacy brands, like Hamaker Schlemmer, which was started in the 1870s, and uh, America's oldest running catalog. And as long as they stay away from the digital, uh, the digital pill, they'd probably be fine. Anyway, sustainability, uh, sustainability, Eco Veritas CEO David Harding Brown said is like an umbrella as an umbrella term is becoming meaningless a series of macro statements that consumers can no longer relate to or engage with i don't know i don't know that that's true you know i think of you know what's the window right like we have in america we have enough petroleum products to last us at least 200 years that's pretty sustainable that's known reserves i'm sure there's more than that um you know nuclear energy seems uh, entirely sustainable now the generation four uh reactors can eat the waste of the generation two and three so that waste that you thought was going to be around forever no all we have to do is put a gen four inside of an old gen two or three plant and it can eat up the waste and that's what powers it so uh, that's a sustainable solution now windmills on the other hand i don't know why but i curiously clicked on a video of windmills exploding <laughs> Top 10 windmills exploding. And I was kind of surprised that three or four of them were like in the last two years. I thought they'd kind of work that out. I also I also looked at the amount of concrete that's in the base of a, one of those windmills. You have no idea. It's unbelievable. It's all underground. They hide it. So it looks like it's just growing out of the ground like a mushroom. Nope. Anyway, so I think there's a lot to be said for sustainability. But, you know, what we want to talk about is marketing sustainability. And that's not really what... Uh, what Tom's talking about today is more like hyping the plant a tree. Well, here's a good cartoon. He's down here. Hello again, sworn enemy. This is the guy with the chainsaw trying to cut down the big tree, and people are around it. And he says, au contraire, I'm environmentally friendly. Now I'm my eco chainsaw is fueled with wind credits, not petroleum. I'm offsetting CO2 with this sapling. Even my chewing tobacco is free trade organic. So step aside while I open up an environmental friendly can of whoop ass on this tree. Yeah. And, you know, there's a lot to be said about that. You know, we we all want to put our best foot forward. But mm, 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 mm. so let's talk about sustainability. OK, one of the keys to sustain, sustainability is lifetime value. OK, 
okay? Lifetime value. I don't know much about this study, and I don't know much about speed of open. I've never heard the term before today. But lifetime value was really invented by Martin Baer at uh, Old American Life Insurance. And Martin taught for years at UMKC, and my, Martin invited me down to be uh, a lecturer, guest lecturer in Bob Stone's uh, direct marketing certification. And I had the highest rated course uh, component or whatever. It was like a full day. So um, it was not just, it was, you know, out of, out of a three-week course, it, it was a big deal. But it was nevertheless the highest rated and it was specifically about lifetime value. Martin and I differed quite a bit. Hey, Steve, nice to see you. Yeah, you know, mail is recyclable. It's paper. It's like 100% recyclable. Although, some say the energy ta that it takes to recycle a piece of paper and create a new piece of paper is much more than the solar energy used to grow a tree trees are recycle are, are trees are sustainable because you can plant more trees and i read that there are more trees now in north america than there were 20 years even 20 years ago but certainly 100 years ago so we've certainly got the we've certainly got the sustainability of trees down right uh i'd like to hear more about it steve but i'm going to go on anyway so lifetime value is basically how much is a customer worth downstream after the initial order? And I've noticed that dot coms don't spend a lot of time on that, whereas catalogers, that's our lifeblood. We want to keep getting orders from the same people. And that's where Martin and I kind of differed. Martin, working in term life insurance, saw that, um, that you know, there was an initial purchase generated by a mailing, in, in his case, because it was way back in the dawn of time. And over time, those would peter out, but they would continue to pay over a certain point. If you ever have thought about c canceling your, if you've ever thought about canceling your term life, you think, well, if I cancel it, I'll probably die tomorrow. So there's a kind of a psychological uh, bump to canceling your life insurance, <laughs> especially if you've still got a spouse or something. Now, if you rum ramp it up, you'll be the first suspect if there's ever any suspicious death. So anyway, uh, I'm going off kilter again. So lifetime value for like a Land's End. I started buying from Land's End in the 70s. I grew up sailing sailboats. They had a kind of a sailing catalog. And I thought, oh, that's cool. And so I started buying from them. I actually went to their original store down on Milwaukee Avenue down toward downtown Chicago, a little bit outside of the loop. And I bought from them ever since. This is a Land's End turtleneck. This isn't a Land's End fleece. This is... This is from a, an ad specialty company, um, and I don't have their catalog handy, but they sent it to me absolutely free, and I loved it, and I've called twice now. Here it is, Positive Promotions. I knew it was around here. Positive Promotions, business card was stapled to the catalog in the box. I've called, I've called Michelle Corrigan two or three times to thank her for the great fleece, but she doesn't call back. No one, no one from the company has ever reached out to me. And I think somebody who is an old friend of mine is even the owner. So we'll have to keep pursuing that. But anyway, I still buy from Land's End every year. And that's what real lifetime value is about. Now let's look at this study for a second. Just look at this. This is why I don't subscribe to, um, I think this one's from Media News, Media Post. Okay, they all blur together. This says, that the va lifetime value of email subscribers based on speed of first open. So the speed of first open is marked 0 to 30. And lifetime engagement value, I'm not sure what that is. I'm guessing it's the likelihood of a renewal of a subscription because it's for, it's for email subscribers. Okay. Now, most of the things I subscribe to on email, I don't pay for. So I'm hoping these are paid subscriptions. But anyway, here, it, it, like I said, it, it's dated 1 to 30. That would suggest that it's like the number of days of a month, okay? But what it says is, is that if somebody waits on your email to open it like 25 days out, 24, I'd say, it's like near infinite lifetime value. Now, there's no scale of value, so this could be a penny and this could be zero, but they never come back 
The nice thing about 8 million, this is a test of 7.55 million new mail email subscribers, is that you get really smooth data and great correlations. But you know, because you've listened to my show, that there's no way that this variable, independent variable called speed of open, determines the lifetime value. That's not at all what determines it. In fact, if you stop producing the emails, the subscription, they will stop reading it. But the weirdest part is, unless this is like miles per hour, like, whoa, I really rushed to get that email open, I have no idea that this makes any sense. This makes no sense. And that's the trouble with big data. You can find correlations because this is not a determining factor. It's not. It's not a controlled factor. It's probably not even a split-tested factor. Okay, so you can't even isolate this variable because it's totally volitional. It's just, we just observe it. There's nothing we can do to, I mean, maybe if we accelerated the open, you know, I don't know how, but anyway, uh, um, <laughs> that maybe if we accelerated the open, it would, they would be worth less and less and less. I'm not even sure, to be honest, and this is pure honesty, I'm not sure what an open is in email. I click on almost all my emails. I mark them all as read. When I mark them all as read, I did 161 this morning in my main email folder just from, you know, over, just from yesterday. I think I, I marked them read yesterday uh, remotely. And so 161 just in my main folder, do those, since they're marked as read, do, does, the, does the mailer think I read them? I didn't. I'm sorry. I apologize, but I didn't read your email. I don't know. If I, if there's only a few in there, sometimes I open the folder and I click on them as if I'm reading them. They do open in the bottom there. They, they, they show. I, sh I see them. I see them. Is that an open? I think it is. S help me out there, Steve. Do you do email enough to know what counts as an open? Because 99%, in other words, uh, at least 99% of the emails that I mark read, I did not even look at, not even a glance, okay? So I don't know that this, these statistics mean a thing, but I can tell you what, they don't mean what the article says. Joe Mancuso, this is why I don't subscribe to your newsletter. Okay, let's go on. This is great. Mark Ritson. The battle, the winner of the COVID vaccine, COVID vaccine brand battle is immigrants. No, it's Pfizer. And Pfizer was started by immigrants, Charles and Charles cousins, Pfizer. One was a candy maker. The other one was just industrious and had some money. And they started a company that promoted merchants' vegetable worm tablets that got rid of worms. And they really did. They were, they were uh, their active ingredient was santonin which was a product that was widely available in Germany, but unheard of in America. And they figured out a way to mass produce it. And that started about 1870 and they made tons of money. And then they were, they were fooling. Oh, and then in 1942, we all know about Andrew Fleming. I think his name is Andrew Fleming, who invented penicillin, right? And, but in 1942, treating just 10 patients with penicillin at one time would have exhausted our nation's supply. Okay? Think about that. Everybody knew it was beneficial. Nobody could use it. Couldn't do anybody any good. Pfizer using deep tank fermentation, because basically we all know from high school that penicillin was like a mold product, Using this, they created enormous quantities of penicillin. And in just a few years, they had, by the end of World War II, they had, America had over 600 billion units of penicillin a year. Then along comes another wonder drug. They were trying to figure out um, a high blood pressure treatment and angina, like cardizin. But instead, they had some weird side effects that people were, that men, <laughs> we're getting, and Viagra was born. Now note the names of these three products, penicillin, Viagra, and vegetable worm treatment. Nothing, right? 
But now Pfizer announced November 5th, the day after the election, or day or two after the election, I noted that. They could have announced it two days sooner. <laughs> they could have given Trump credit because, you know, he beat on them, but I don't think they liked it. So Oxford was going to develop a product called As with a with the company partner AstraZeneca. And but first in some test, they said it was only 62 percent effective. Then it was 70 percent effective. But in not, but then there was a small group and this made the news that were misdosed with a smaller initial dose. And then it was over 90 percent. And that's kind of how this stuff goes. You know, you don't always know what's going to happen. It turned out a, a smaller dose was more effective than a larger dose. Because, you know, what we're trying to do in uh, vaccination, if you remember the cowpox story of the milkmaids who didn't get smallpox, we're trying to give your body a little taste of a virus, just enough to get it to trigger its own immune system. Now, in this case, I believe in the case of this, and I'm not a medical expert, but I think they're actually trying to have your body sort of write the code to create that little piece, which is a little bit beyond anything they've ever tried before. So who knows what the long-term sustainable effects will be. But, um, but Oxford lost the battle in a test that no one understands. <laughs> and so consequently, you say, well, maybe, maybe with a little more testing, Oxford will, will surpass Pfizer. Right. But guess what? In Italy, a group of angry doctors said they don't want the Oxford one. Germany, uh, only 13% of the Oxford doses have been used, in, uh, and Oxford is becoming a Regelwama. Well, I don't know how to speak German. Regelwama. Anyway, a shelf filler that no one wants. In Austria, hundreds of medical staff signed protests. In France and Sweden, uh, in France and Sweden, Oxford has they've reported major side effects now here's the part to note look at the bottle coronavirus pfizer they finally figured it out why don't we put our own name on this product who knew that penicillin was basically created and you know g marketed by pfizer who knew that worm treatment was who knew that you know that Viagra, penicillin, Viagra, these are big deals. And, uh, but this time they put their name on it. So Mark Ritson thinks that's really good. And you, you can say, well, yeah, but aren't we worried more about the effectiveness? Does the, does the brand matter? Would a rose by any other name smell as sweet? Well, Mark argues that it does. And I think there's something to it. But what I would say is that the brand is the, is the entire package. So, you know, it's not just the bottle. It's not just the advertising. It's, you know, what are, what are the, what's the effectiveness? How often do I have to use it? Long term, there's probably ch a chance for a number two. Um, you know, I'm hoping for the one shot Johnson & Johnson myself. But how does this apply to direct mail? Okay, here's what I think. I think that a Land's End brand, you know, they don't talk a lot about brand. Uh, they've always done a nice catalog. They've had nice products. But I told you one time when I went, was working with them on this, on a, the training game that was actually used for Bob Stone's course, Land's End and I developed it. Um, when we were working together, I was looking for a book uh, of a particular title. And they said, well, we got a library. Uh, let's go look in the library. And um, it was locked. So the, the person who brought me there went to find the person who had the key. And while I was standing in the hallway, I heard a vendor meeting. They were, they were introducing their product, their um, like ho household products, like bed sheets and bath towels. And I heard the Land's End person say, we're not gonna tell you how to make bath towels, but we have a lifetime guarantee and we mean it. And we don't want anybody to think that they didn't get their money's worth, okay? And they said, so we want you to make a really, really good towel, a really, really good value. We want you to, we want you to know that we'll stand behind it for all those years. And you know, it was really nice to hear them say that in closed door meeting that no one else would know about except I happen to be standing in the hallway and I happen to have a, uh, a, a 
marketing <laughs> blog here. What's made, what's made direct mail sustainable is in large part because we always did care about the long-term value of the customer. L.L. Bean, when they got started, you know, Leon, uh, or whatever, uh, Mr. Bean had, uh, had these boots, these waterproof boots that he sold, and they pretty much all failed. They all came apart. The seam between the rubber and the leather broke until he figured it out. And so every one of those boots he replaced, no charge, okay? And that said something to the people that had those boots, that he's going to stand behind that product. And L.L. Bean is just an icon, right, a legend. I mean the company, because they do stand behind it. And you know what else? We look forward to their catalogs. It's sustainable. It's rock solid in our minds. I was Andrew, um, Andrew Ettinger. Uh, I was privileged to, to, to hear from Andrew, and he sent me a recording of a conversation with a I think with a new prospect. I'm not sure who the prospect was or who the company was. But they were explaining to the, to the probably the owner or the marketing guy at the company. They were saying, now here's where your customers are on the map. And here's the carrier routes that fit those your customer profile. And here's how it would work. And here's how we would mail 10,000. And here's how we would mail 20,000. It was clear, it was understandable, it was just fantastic. I, and, you know, and Andrew, and I encourage you to watch the, the 18 or 20 minute um, interview that Dave Rosendahl did with Andrew. Uh, I put it up last week. It's something like direct mail isn't dead yet. <laughs> and Andrew explains that if somebody calls and just wants to pr a print job run or wants to do a mailing, Andrew tells them that that's not what we do. You know, we teach you how to do sustainable marketing. And Andrew mentions, and some of the other guys on the, on the video mention, people that have been mailing for 20 years and don't do any digital and are always busy and keep growing. Mail is, is far more proven. Mail is sustainable for the last 150 years at least. Digital... They didn't even start measuring digital until 2009 in terms of ad spend. And my guess is that it'll be like every other, every other buzzword. You know, it'll have its day and some, something will be left. Something will survive. But I hope you didn't bet your company on the sustainability of AdWords or of banner ads or of the ever-changing email landscape because... We'll see. Like who's going to win, ultimately win the vaccine war. We'll see. Time will tell. Right? But time has proven time and time and time again that the people that keep mailing are the people that keep going. Have a great day. Like and share. Your friends will know you're smart. I'm John Mayer.